Well, we're finishing up the center line on Orca. Really, the stern post and the horn tip were the only two pieces left. And uh, we're just going to get right after that. The first thing we started with out on the floor was the keel. And then we added the forefoot and a little spanner between the two to make that joint really nice and strong. We added the stem and a gripe, a two-piece gripe between the forefoot and the stem. Then we went back after the stern post and dropped that into a blind mortise. Today we're going to get out and install our horn timber. That's the piece that runs from the top of the stern post all the way to the transom, about seven feet. That's the profile of Orca right there with a slanted forefoot and a radical stern post in it. So that horn timber completes the center line of the boat. The rudder post goes through it and the prop is underneath it. So it's a pretty important piece right here and uh, we've got a very, very nice piece of wood to make it out of. And if you guys like what we do, you know, like and subscribe and check out our Patreon page because there's a lot of ways of getting involved with our Orca project. Now we're just trimming some weight off each side of the horn timber here because it's just too heavy to handle. We don't need to handle an extra 200 pounds on each side. So we've cut that off and uh, then we're going to put it up on the bandsaw and make a nice neat cut. I don't have a guide. I don't have any sawmill. I don't have anything like that. I've got a battery powered chainsaw. Amazingly enough, that saw will cut material like this. As big as this, 16 inches deep. It's incredible. I sharpened the chain five degrees across so it's sharpened to rip and it really makes a nice cut. You know, it, it's a miracle how these tools work, these battery powered tools. I just love them. Well, as you can see, we use quite a few Royobi tools and uh, this is a little message to Royobi. We'd love for you to send us one of those exoskeletons and we'll do all kinds of things with it. One thing that's a little difficult really here is to follow the line. And there really isn't any reason for it other than the uh, cuttings pile up and you, you, you can't see where you're going. So once in a while we have to stop and brush it off or we take a blower and blow it off there so I can just keep right on going. I'm reaching right through it at this point and I'm near the end of the cut so, you know, it, it's been a success here. Now the reason I made that cut with a chainsaw was so that I could get most of this weight off of it actually because the thing was so big we couldn't even handle it. So I'm actually going to use the same line that I cut this with but I stayed away from the line about a quarter of an inch. So I'm going to flip it over and, and uh, smooth out the other side. That's the side that's going to be running through the saw. So we're going to flip it, finish the other side a little bit and uh, get going on the bandsaw. The other thing I wanted to show you is this little gizmo. People have been asking me a little bit. It's a Royobi electric chainsaw, 40 volt. Now, you know, uh, they're not made for industrial use, I don't think, really. But, uh, you know, I had to do a few alterations. One is I installed this little oil can right here. It's got a thumb activator right here, just like an old, old chainsaw would have instead of the automatic oiler. I can push this button and I get plenty of oil. You can see how I ran it right outside the chainsaw and Look at it, it just goes right in, plugs right into where the other oiler actually works. So the other thing I did was I cut this out right here in the corner right here. It kind of had a, a flap over it like that because it was, it was jamming up too much, too fast. So when I cut that little piece out of there and I got rid of all the hangs right in here, it just shoots the stuff right out and you never have any problems. So I'm on my own oiling system. It's obvious that this little chainsaw is kind of meant for home use and stuff, I guess, but it made that cut nine inches deep and 10 feet long. You know, so, you know, they, if you set them up right, they'll do quite a bit of work. Nothing like an automatic oiler. This is how much oil I really need right here. Watch this. Look that thing pumping oil right out of there. That's what I need to know when I'm making a big, long cut like that. Before I take this piece over to the ship saw, you know, I've trimmed some weight off each side and I've got a little electric planer here and I'm smoothing up one side. This would be the side that's going down on the bandsaw. You know, I want it to slide through the bandsaw real easy so you don't want big giant imperfections. You can tell some places it's, it's uh, free like that, but you can't hardly see under it or anything. And there's other places it's kind of tight. It's free on the end, it's a little tight right here. I'm going to take one little pass with a plane and it'll be right. You can actually feel it under the plane where it has to be removed. You can also hear it, you know, and uh, 
The plane cuts backwards as good as it cuts forward, even better. And it cuts smoother cutting backwards, so. Let's try it again. Oh, look at that, just sitting right on there, nice. I'm gonna go all the way down and see what that looks like. Uh, it's got one little spot right on the end here to go yet, so I'll take care of that. So that's how I know where the high spots are. So we just take my little planer and knock those right down. I've got it set to it's just barely thousands of an inch, so it really works like a hand plane actually, but obviously much easier. Oh, yeah, nice, real nice. We're gonna flip the horn jimba over now, and that's the way it's gonna go through the saw. So we've got it on dollies, and we're gonna wheel it over there and line it up with the bandsaw, but we have to lift it up quite a bit higher. We'll get one end up in the bandsaw. I'm just gonna go over this cut with Halsey a little bit so we're on the same page. And he's gonna do the pushing, and I'm gonna do the steering. And then I've got this like makeshift dolly here. You know, it just works great because it works in any direction other than like a, a cylindrical roller because a cylindrical roller kind of can steer you off course and this thing goes anywhere. So once we get it halfway through and it's balanced on the saw, we just take the little table and bring it around the other side and then feed the piece out on that. Now if we want to make another cut on the other side, we just slide it back, bring the table around the other side and do it there. It, uh, it just works fantastic. It's something that if you tried to cut that without that little table, you'd be struggling because that thing is heavy. You need something to hold the other end up and we have it. This piece has got some checking on one side, but I'm going to take two inches off. This is the part of the tree that's just under the bark, really, or under the sapwood. And you can see that uh, the checking looks a little wide, but when I get this piece off, you're going to be surprised because it's going to look nice and clear. You know, I have to be able to anticipate these things when I'm looking at lumber or logs at the sawmill. I have to know what I'm going to be able to get out of it. You know, and sometimes they don't look all that good, whether it's knots or checks or split or who knows what. But, uh, you know, hopefully there's always a way around it. I'm gonna take my little electric plane and smooth up the other side. It's really easy to do and I don't have that much in material to take off. It's just a saw curve because it's gonna be laying against the fence and I want it to travel along nice and smooth. It's obvious that this plane works really, really good and uh, it shoots the chips a mile in either direction. It's really because I altered it. It's got a few alterations to it and made a tremendous tool out of it. I just shot, I just flattened that. Yeah, okay, so it's gonna go that way. Like that, now I gotta draw a line on it. All right. Let's try it. This is a real deep cut right here. I think most people would have a lot of trouble doing this because, you know, you have to have your fence set up perfectly, the saw has to be set up perfectly, the guides, the wheels, all those things. We put a line on it, but basically it's just for reference because we are ripping this piece off a fence. Yeah, I wanted to see how well it would do it because sometimes when you drift off the line a little bit and you've got a fence, it's kind of hard to get back because the saw doesn't have enough set in it. So I set the teeth a little extra on both sides and sharpened up with a diamond file. So this is about as sharp as it gets right here. I just wanted to see how well it would rip. If it drifted off the line a little bit, can you get it to come right back? And the answer is yes. You just need to have quite a bit of set in the teeth and then you can handle it very easily. But if you didn't have enough set and your steer's off the line a little bit, you can't get back. So this is set up properly and uh, this is what we want it to do. Boom. Nice. Yeah, you might wonder how I knew that was in there. You know what I mean? I knew it was in there, look how pretty. I am gonna run it through a planer and uh, true it up really nice, but uh, you're probably wondering how I knew that that piece of lumber was inside that big hunk, and uh, you know, I knew pretty much everything about it that I needed to know. I've cut all the scrap right off of it all the way around. I've got it down to five inches right now. It's gonna be in the boat like that, and uh, it's gonna have a hole cut right up into it right here for the stern post to go right up through it. 
And uh, all they used to do was they'd run it through. They didn't even use any bolts or anything. They'd drill a hole in it and put a peg through it, and that was it. But uh, we were able to bolt it, you know, so. And it's got a little bit of generous lint here. You know, I got to cut a little bit of it off. It's got a little bit of soft spot right in here, a brownness right in there, just one spot. So I'll probably knock that off and then cut some of this off down here and use maybe eight feet of it. This is 10 feet right now. So this is a really nice piece of lumber right here. This is what you need when you're building a boat like this. You want something that, that uh, you know is going to stay together, and this one will right here. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. Well, you've probably seen this before, but I'm not so sure you've seen the gripe in it. We had a brace on it like this when we bolted this together like that, but uh, since then I've put two pieces in here, two six bys for a gripe and bolted it right through, so that's all secure for right now. I've got a tape measure set up here, and I've got six inches of it hanging over up forward because that's pretty much what the pitch of the stem is, so, you know, I'm going to take the tape and run it all the way down here and see how long Orca is actually going to be. Now, I'm going to go to the head of the stern post and see what I get. I've got 33 feet. So I need seven feet more to make a 40-foot boat. So I am going to extend past the stern post with the horn timber all the way out to here, 40 feet. These Novies had the stern post way up underneath them, and that's the way they had to have it so they would turn very quickly. Same thing about the forefoot. It's cut away so that the boats pivot very easily because when they're coming up on single traps, you know, they, may, they don't want to go by them and have to turn around in circles and come back for them and all that stuff. They want to turn very quickly and pick up the buoys. So this is going to be the last piece of the center line other than probably a piece in here to make a gripe like I did up forward. So let's roll up the tape here and we're going to go on to our horn timber. But wow, doesn't that look like something right there? That kind of gives you an idea how big it is. You know, it's going to be seven feet past that horn timber. So. We actually have to slide it forward quite a bit because uh, it's too far aft in the shop right here right now. So what I'm going to do is cut right down the inside of that line that I've made with a ballpoint pen because it stands out really nice and right down the inside of that one uh, as close as I can get. But uh, I have to make sure that it's tipped in the tiniest bit. Otherwise, I could have it too wide on the other side. So it's time to be very, very careful. This thing got quite a reaction in our last video. It, it, it's just a couple of spark plug sockets and a piece of rod. I didn't even cut the rod. I found the rod that went and I drilled one hole in the bar. What I'm going to do is take the tip of my chainsaw and plunge it right down in there. But I hold those sockets right up against the two by fours, you know, and that's what makes it safe right there. But you can't really kick back on me and, uh, you know, you, you, you can't have that because you could either ruin this piece of wood or you could ruin yourself pretty quickly, you know, if you don't have it under control. So, you know, I'm not using this tip like I did on the other cut. I'm not grading the bottom of this cut. What I'm going to do is, is flip it over because the way I've got this set up, it won't cut all the way through. It cuts about four inches and the piece is five inches. So once I've got as much as I can done, you know, plunging from one side, then I'm going to flip the piece over and do exactly the same thing on the other side. Really what I'm trying to do is get a hole all the way through with enough room to put the chainsaw through. I didn't get near the ends really because the cut has got a little angle on the ends, both ends, five degrees, so I can't cut it straight down, but I'm just staying away from it. Once I make my way through, then I'm going to remove the spark plug sockets and take this chainsaw and chop a bunch of those slivers out of the way because I'm going to stand it on end because it makes it way more comfortable to hold the chainsaw. And I'm going to cut up to those lines, rip right up to those lines. And I want to be able to see both sides so I can tell what I'm doing. Walker was a Nova Scotian lobster boat when it was built. I mean, it has a stern post instead of a big wooden shaft log. It isn't built like main boats, but this is what you'd see. You'd see the stern post mortised into the keel and the stern post mortised into the horn timber. Well, we've got our horn timber stood up right here and uh, we've wedged it up in the block here so that it'll be nice and stable so it doesn't wiggle around when I'm cutting it. But I'm going to put my saw right through there. If it was laying down on a couple horses, I'd have to get down on the ground and look up at it. This, this really makes it easy. 
you know, I'm giving it some grace on the other side, I'm nowhere near the line. Then I'll go around the other side and cut from that side up to the line. Maybe there's a spot right in the middle there that needs to be cut with a hammer and a mallet. This is really easy to do and I get to see it from both sides. That's a real advantage because if I don't cut right up near the line, I have way too much material to move with a hammer and chisel. So I get one side cut all the way down to the line and then I go over on the other side, you know, where I haven't come to the line and cut it from the other side. Look how nice the end of it came out right here, nice and smooth and everything with a chainsaw graded back and forth like that. You know, I've got it almost splitting the pencil lines right in half, so it came out really nice and square, parallel, everything. Now I'm just gonna lay it down and touch it up with a chisel. We've prepared a mortise in the horn timber, and I've got my tenon cut here. We're gonna try it, this will be the first time out right here, but you know, I imagine it'll take a little bit of fitting, but let's just see how it goes here. Well, we've got it dropped into position there, and you can see it fits really tight. And, and it's too tight, it won't go down. But all of this, it slipped right in there into the last five inches. And now I've done that on purpose so that it'll be fit nice and tight. And now I have to check very carefully and make sure that this plane right here is heading in the same direction that the other one is on the other side as far as being centered on the end of the horn timber. You know, I have a little bit of fit left, and not only can I use that fit to be nice and fit tight, I can actually steer this thing so that it ends up with this tenon lined up the way I want it on the end of the horn timber. We've got it lined up the way we want it, and the next thing for us to do is to just drop it down, fit it nice and sweet, and then we're gonna carry the whole thing back aft. Like I said, we got a, just a little bit of fitting to do to get this to slide right down there easily because uh, you don't want it to be too tight if this swelled up a lot or something, which it's not going to do, but the idea would be it would split this. So there's our tenon right there, right up through a mortise in the horn timber. Now, obviously, we're going to push it right down into place, and then we'll probably put two bolts right through this whole thing right here. And, uh, you know, maybe the Nova Scotians wouldn't even use bolts at all because of the cost of stuff like that. So what they would do is drill a hole right above it like this, and uh, through that hole they would pound a black locust peg and that peg would stop this thing from moving. That would be it. That's all they did. They did the same thing at the bottom. This one's going to be bolted. So that one's a blind tenon. This one's a through tenon. And the whole idea of it is that I'm going to check the direction of the horn timber and see if it doesn't shoot right down the keel just perfectly. Because this is the opportunity to get it really crooked or really straight. Well, there's the three pieces we've been working on right back there with the mortise and tenon. And, uh, you know, I got to line it up, make sure it's lined up perfectly. Putting a rabbit in the whole keel, the stern post, a rabbited horn timber, forefoot and stem, both sides. Now, that seems like quite a bit of work. Orca deserves a really nice job, and I've come up with this little gizmo that actually cuts the rabbit to progressive bevel hooked up to a chainsaw, so that's going to be pretty cool. My little, my little unit that I've been practicing with has been really fun for me, and now I'm going to put it to use right here.